Okay, I think we'll just, let's get going. Um, hi everyone, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where the world you are. Um, big thanks uh, and a welcome to everyone who's joined, friends, colleagues, ex-colleagues, customers. Um, I hope you're as excited as I am to learn more about what is unfortunately one of the hottest topics uh, of today. Our two speakers, uh, who I'll introduce to you in a moment, uh, have a very unique perspective uh, of this topic, and that's sort of the wink and the nudge, and hence the title of today's webinar. Um, so I'm confident uh, we're in for a treat, or, or at the very least, uh, we'll learn something new and interesting. Uh, I'm Dave Mareels, your host for today, as well as the CEO and co-founder of SocOS, which is a recent BAE system spin-out company and member of the Intelligence Network, and hence the connection between the three parties represented here today. Uh, 10 second overview about SocOS is we're a SaaS product, um, making the lives of alert fatigued analysts a hell of a lot easier when it comes to triaging alerts, accelerating that time to that aha moment um, and giving them better visibility and helping them spot signal within the noise uh, to ultimately help them respond more effectively and efficiently. But you're here today not to hear from me and chat SecOps, uh, you're here to listen to two of my very bright ex-colleagues, James and Adrian. Uh, good to be linked up together again, guys, and a massive thanks to both of you for joining me and our audience today. And on that note, let me show you our agenda and introduce you to James and Adrian more formally. So here is how we plan to spend the next 45 minutes or so together. It's going to be a quick overview from me or an intro from me rather, which is, which is almost done, thankfully. Uh, then first up, we'll hear from James Muir. James, a bit of an overview for James, is, is a research lead uh, in the BA Systems Threat Intelligence team, and his eight years at the company have seen him conduct cyber research projects from government and financial services customers with a number of publications to his name. His current research interests are, no surprises here, the ransomware threat and the potential use of artificial intelligence by cyber threat actors. Uh, James also looks after one of the topics of the intelligence network, which he'll be telling us all about shortly. And I think the hint there is in the topic title. Uh, then James will head straight over and we'll segue to Dr. Adrian Nish. Adrian is the head of cyber propositions at BAE Systems with responsibility for overseeing BAE's cyber product portfolio, business strategy and investment. Prior to this, Adrian uh, ran the cyber technical services team at BAE, leading areas of threat intel, incident response and security testing. Adrian's background is predominantly technical uh, with expertise in cyber data analysis and investigation. Uh, he has a passion for geopolitics, the social impact of technology and the relationship, in fact, between security and tech. Adrian holds a PhD in, the phys in physics from the University of Oxford. Uh, in Adrian's section, labelled uh, threats and opportunities, uh, he'll share insights on the threat landscape, show you what a ransom negotiation looks like, and share some recommendations and security best practices to help us all fight against this ransomware storm which we find ourselves in. Now, I wish more than anyone uh, we were together in the flesh where we could ask questions, interrupt on the fly, but instead we're in this virtual context. So I do ask, however, please write down any burning questions you have as and when they appear to you on the fly. Send them to me privately on the chat or to everyone if you want to pub publicize it, and I'll do my best to make sure we address them at the end. We've left about 10 minutes um, for some Q&A, which I'll moderate. So I'm chomping at the bit to get going. I hope you guys are as well. That's enough from me. Please, all I ask for is your undivided attention for the next 30 or minute, 30 minutes or so. Uh, James, welcome to the virtual stage, mate. And uh, first up, over to you. Thanks very much, Dave. Uh, just checking you can hear me okay? Perfect, yep. Lovely. Let's, um, let's get some slides up, shall we? A quick disclaimer about said slides. Please do not adjust your screen. Um, this is how they are supposed to look. Uh, Okay, great. So yeah, uh, thanks Dave for the intro. I am James. Uh, I'm the Threat Intelligence Research Lead here at BA Systems Applied Intelligence. Um, but here really today to tell you about my work on the Intelligence Network. Um, so without further ado, what is the Intelligence Network? Well, um, this screenshot from our website will hopefully help me out. Um, it's an industry initiative launched by BA Systems in, in 2018 powered by a global community of like-minded cyber and financial crime professionals and industry influencers committed and this is this is the key bit to creating a safer society in the digital age that's kind of the mission statement uh, of the intelligence network um so you see some keywords here collaboration is a key one um and just to explain that a bit more 
you know, who, who's involved, who has been collaborating to date and who will collaborate in future. Um, here are the list of the supporters of the intelligence network. Um, so you've got a huge range of different companies, sectors, disciplines here. Um, powerhouses such as Microsoft, really exciting startups such as uh, shout out to Dave and Soco S crew um, and think tanks such as Rusi. So bringing that policy perspective as well. So a really nice melting pot uh, for this analysis. Um, just to flesh out a bit more on what we're looking at, uh, these are the seven themes, um, which three of which are live. So the top three are currently live. Um, my one, Understanding Adversaries, we'll go into in a bit more detail. That's been live about a year, just to give you an idea. Uh, we are due to be bringing on the fourth soon. Uh, more information about all of these is available on the website, which I'll uh, point you to in due course. Um, so yeah, you can see we've got threat intelligence topics, cyber fraud, emerging technology, privacy, these kind of themes, and all together they, they kind of knit a meshwork of, um, of what the intelligence network is trying to achieve. Okay, um, so let's dive into understanding adversaries then. Um, this is really about two things. Well, the primary aim is how, how can we better counter the threat and the threat landscape, and that kind of has two uh, elements to it. One is kind of really understanding the trends in the threat landscape, explaining those, working out what the core problems are, uh, and also kind of looking internally at the threat and in intelligence industry and what we can do better. Um, so I'll go through these step by step. Uh, and the first one really is is really um, about the key themes and, and what we've been looking at. Uh, so this timeline here uh, is one, two, three, four, five, six, eight uh, fairly notable cyber attacks or events or whatever you want to call them in recent months. Um, and, you know, we've got so SolarWinds, Oldsmar, uh, Microsoft Exchange, a bunch of ransomware attacks, um, PulseCure, VPNs getting, uh, you know, compromised by state actors, um, a big array of stuff. Um, but I think the key themes that kind of come out of all of this is uh, the supply chain, no surprises there, um, vulnerabilities in enterprise IT, you know, that's that's been ever present for um, as long as, as a cyber threat has been a thing, um, but really has come to the fore this year in um, some of the external infrastructure side of things, and really the potency of the ransomware threat, and that is ultimately where we've focused attention so far. Um, but I suppose so at the top it's also about looking internally, um, and just as an example of this, uh, you can find our, our team's perspective on um, MITRE ATT&CK, which we've adopted as of many others, and it's really become an industry standard for kind of explaining common language of, of threat. Uh, we're big fans of MITRE ATT&CK, big fans of uh, malware information sharing platform, MISP, um, and other things as well. So it's, it's about both of these elements, um, but we'll spend uh, the rest of this session looking at uh, ransomware in particular. Okay, so ransomware work to date, if my slides decide to work. Come on slides. There we go. Okay, um, so back in March, uh, we produced a collaborative report with with Rusi. Um, so James Sullivan, who heads up Rusi's cyber research team and myself co authored um, what uh, is called in, in Rusi speak an emerging insights paper. Uh, so this published, I think, first of March. So maybe it's 31st of March, a um, load of work went into it, combining um, our team's insight into the ransomware threat and our tracking of, um, of victim blogs, so-called, and Adrian will go into that in a bit more detail when I hand over to him. Um, putting together the the storm, you know, the perfect storm, this analogy I see continues into today's session. Uh, and there's actually, a, you know, you could put another word in front of storm to, uh, to explain ransomware quite nicely. Um, looking at the reasons why ransomware has become such a big th problem, and then melding that with Rusi's policy analysis. Um, so here is a text that says, you know, looking at policy options for organizations, policymakers, law enforcement, and national level cybersecurity agencies. Um, a bit of a call to arms for, here's how we think you could act. Here's how I think we can we can do better. Um, and yeah, the link to it is there if you, if you wanna read more, if you haven't seen that already. Um, and one of the things that dropped out of this and has become a really hot topic, um, and you, you probably have seen plenty of, of noise around this online, is uh, the kind of pressing question of whether ransom payments can or should be banned, um, and whether that would work as a policy instrument to curb the ransomware threat. Um, so I took that topic into um, the most recent Intelligence Network Steering Committee meeting, uh, and we had a really good debate for about half an hour, um, capturing perspectives from all over different industries and sectors. We had representatives from insurance there, um, and I produced a, a blog, which you can find at that link there, to ban or not to ban. Um, our creative team went with a, a nice little Shakespearean 
theme there. Um, and yeah, the, the graphic at the bottom kind of summarizes succinctly the, the pros, the cons, and you know, there are tons of complexities to this um, as a policy instrument. Um, so yeah, we're, we're you know, pleased with that blog. I think it's a good example of collaboration within uh, the intelligence network to produce a kind of pan industry view on something. Um, really hot topic, and that's gone into um, off to a, a bunch of contacts in um, various bits of government that are looking at this problem um, at present. So that's that's been a really good outcome from that. Uh, so lastly then, before I hand over to Adrian, just how to get involved. Um, if anything that I've said today chimes, um, any of these themes kind of stand out as something you might want to get involved in, um, please do see the website here. Uh, it's linked there on the slides um, or just Google, you know, the Intelligence Network uh, and maybe BA Systems afterwards and you'll, you'll definitely get there. Uh, contact details at the bottom through LinkedIn or email um, if you do want to get involved and there's a number of options so you can sign up as an individual we're, we're going to be producing a newsletter soon and uh, to keep everyone up to date with what's going on and the website goes into a bit more detail about what it means to be a corporate supporter or indeed um, part of our steering committee so that is all uh, hopefully I've kept the time and yeah thank you very much I, I think I'll stop sharing now and then hand over to Adrian Thank you very much, James. Uh, right, let me get my slides up. Okay, is that all up on one screen or are you seeing it on two? One screen, a little bit of a gray square here. Okay, we'll get rid of that. Right. Okay. So yes. ransomware. I'm sure all of you have heard uh, many of the kind of stories over the last uh, few months. I mean, ransomware has been just a, a massive topic. It's hit the headlines on numerous occasions. So what I'm going to share today is just a few insights from our own research. Um, and this is mainly through uh, tracking blogs that the attackers have uh, have released. Uh, but it gives us a nice kind of insight into the, the, the stats, I guess, behind it. I'm going to start, though. Um, a little bit unusually with some recommendations. Usually I, I finish presentations with recommendations, but in this case, uh, these, these recommendations uh, are interesting. So if you read through what they say, they talk about uh, recommendations basically that are being given to somebody post-incident uh, to do sensible things like turn off your local passwords, uh, change your administrator credentials, make some uh, group policy changes, uh, again, more kind of password changes, all sort of very sensible enterprise security recommendations, not too dissimilar to what we would recommend to customers uh, post incident. And the uh, person that this uh, individual is chatting with all, um, you know, is, is very appreciative, clearly. Now, the uh, twist with these set of recommendations is actually these are taken from a dialogue that a ransomware operator has been having with the victim. So that is the ransomware operator actually giving some recommendations for how to improve the security after they've just stolen. In this case, I think it's a couple of million US dollars. Um, and the, the, the individual obviously, you know, is, uh, is, is uh, you know, very kind of polite about this. We, we managed to capture this uh, session because the, uh, the instructions that the attacker um, had given in their particular ransomware note uh, basically told the victim to go to a certain uh, a certain URL on the dark web, and that was contained within the malware. So when we found the malware, looked at the malware, we found that particular URL. When we went to that URL, this whole chat was still there. It was still up and live. There was no kind of login needed. It was just open and kind of public. So we were able to take a, a copy of this and um, basically get an idea of what had happened here. So the initial kind of chat starts with um, uh, so the support. This is the ransomware operator uh, uh, saying, yeah, how can I help you? The uh, victim saying, we need to get our data back, please. And eventually it gets to initial demand, which is 10 million US dollars. This is a victim in, in the US, 10 million US dollars. Uh, you know, the negotiator then kind of brings it down a bit. So says, yeah, we, we can't really pay that. I've had a bad year, it's coronavirus and all the rest. Comes down to 8 million. And, uh, you know, go away, have a bit of a think about it, obviously get permission, eventually get down to 4.5 million and say, oh, you know, got a deal. 
Um, so they, they, they negotiated it down from 10 million. I'm sure the negotiator is pretty pleased and probably got a, a good bonus for that. But at the end of the day, this organization paid the criminals 4.5 million US dollars. And we can verify that because it's paid through Bitcoin. So all we have to do is look up on the, the blockchain and we can see, uh, in this case, uh, 414 Bitcoins uh, were paid to the particular address that's given in the blog. And um, uh, uh, that's 4.5 million uh, US dollars. Now, the victim in this case was a company called Carson Wagonly Travel. They're actually a pretty major uh, uh, sort of travel operator used by corporates, uh, used by a lot of government agencies as well to organize travel. So quite sensitive that they, they got compromised. Um, and, you know, uh, I guess a, a somewhat controversial that they just stumped up the cash. Um, but in a lot of cases, what's happening behind the scenes is that they'll have gotten in touch with their insurer. Their insurer will have uh, recommended a, uh, a ransom negotiator and the ransom negotiator will have got that initial ransom down from 10 million to 4.5 million. Uh, and ultimately it'll have been covered on the insurance. From the insurer's perspective, less costly than uh, perhaps the, uh, you know, the full payout if they didn't get their files back, be a lot of business disruption, et cetera. So from the insurer's perspective, they're incentivized to do it. Negotiators incentivized, the business incentivized to just pay it. And then the attackers win uh, every time. So again, you'll have seen loads of stories about this in, in the press. These are just a, a few examples. So. Um, uh, meat processing plant in the US. That one was interesting. They paid 11 million US dollars. They uh, uh, apparently claimed when they paid that um, they weren't suffering a disruption, but they wanted to mitigate future potential risk because they knew the attacker had been in the network and they didn't quite know what they took. So they basically wanted to pay off the attacker to not do anything bad in future. Again, paying criminal actor here. So how much you can believe uh, what they say to you is another question. Colonial Pipeline got lots of press, uh, you know, huge disruption in the US, people weren't able to get gas in petrol stations. The Irish ransomware attack, very interesting one. They did get the decryption key. So for whatever reason, the attackers changed their mind about the whole ransom and extortion. They gave them the uh, decryption key, but there was a huge disruption, huge amount of effort to actually get things back up and running. Uh, massive impact on on the Irish healthcare system. Uh, Travelex uh, was forced into administration. They claimed that this was partly due to the ransomware attack they ha that that happened. Uh, you know, Hackney Borough Council they got hacked uh, about October last year. Um, they there was a, a, a claim that the uh, uh, level of property purchases in Hackney was impacted by this because people weren't able to actually get uh, survey and search uh, related information done because all the systems that are needed to do that uh, have been taken down. So lots of real world impacts from, from this stuff. So how is this all happening then? What are the kind of tactics that the criminals are using? So it all starts with a network intrusion and, and these will come in via a phishing email, will come in via an exploit vulnerability, come in via something like a remote desktop protocol. So maybe during the pandemic, you know, organizations set up way for their administrators to access remotely. They didn't lock it down so well. The attackers are exploiting that. Uh, or in a lot of cases, they come in by a third party or a managed service provider. So it's not necessarily your security that's bad. It's that of a, a, a trusted third party who's got access to your network and they've, 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 they've had the breach. Well, once inside the network, then they use the sort of standard uh, network intrusion tactics that you know we've seen from espionage groups in the past, for example, they'll propagate across the network, they'll get admin access, they'll steal whatever data they can get a hold of. Most often they'll go for things like um, uh, document stores, so SharePoint sites, for example, um, but they will look for specific information. So for example, they, in, in one case we did an instant response for, they got a hold of the um, cyber insurance policy of the victim. So when they got in touch with the victim, they said, we know you've got cyber insurance, we know you can afford to pay, pay us, here's your policy. So they, they look for very specific information and they look for what will cause the most impact as well. So any kind of personal information or sensitive personal information like health information of employees. Um, they, will, they will of course encrypt things as well, but that's the kind of immediate pain, but the sort of longer term damage can come from what they've stolen. 
the ransom demand comes in. Uh, if the victim doesn't pay, they'll increase the stakes. What they do now is they publish uh, on blogs. So they publish in kind of a name and shame fashion. They leak a little bit of data. Again, they can kind of ratchet it up by leaking more kind of sensitive data to get the attention of the uh, of the victim. Uh, we've seen some tactics like they'll say they're going to auction the data. Again, kind of drives um, uh, more sort of publicity to the to the whole incident. So the interesting thing about the fact that the blogs uh, are out there in public um, is that we can track them. So we can see uh, who the victims are and basically scrape that information and use that to derive some some trends from that. So even though the, the blogs are all on like dark web, the onion websites, uh, it's still pretty easy to 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 get access to them. They're meant to be sort of open and and easy to find. So over the past kind of uh, year and a half, so going back to the start of 2020, we've seen probably around about 50 different blogs that have uh, popped up. Some of them uh, don't last very long. They disappear. Um, some of them sometimes they just get kind of rewritten. They appear as a different sort of alias. So at the moment, we're tracking kind of about 25 to 30 live blogs. And we see on average six new victims per day appearing across all of those blogs. So in total, going back to the start of 2020, it's 3,000 victims uh, that have been named uh, on one of these blogs. There was a big increase in activity through 2020, and that was mainly due to uh, copycat groups uh, appearing. So it initially started with groups like Maze. They kind of, uh, I guess, led the way in terms of um, not just the kind of network intrusion and ransom, but this whole tactic around publishing on blogs. And then you've got a whole bunch of kind of copycat attackers doing the same thing. So that kind of big increase through 2020 is mainly just other criminal groups getting into the game. That's then kind of leveled off in 2020, in 2021. Um, some groups seem to have disappeared. Some have claimed they've retired. Whether you believe that or not, who knows? Um, others, uh, you know, may be impacted by law enforcement operations, um, but it's kind of leveled off in terms of uh, of the activity, um, and and even decreased a little bit in the last couple of months. Another interesting thing that we see from tracking the blogs is that uh, sometimes victims get removed, so they've been up on the blog, they get taken off the blog, and that's a clear indication when a victim has paid. Because part of paying, you get your name taken off the blog. So over all of the data that we've got, 7% of the victims at some point get removed from a blog. So we reckon 7% of victims uh, uh, pay the actual ransom. So in terms of victim location, first of all, most of the victims are in the US. So over 55% uh, are, are organizations that are headquartered in the US. Um, some campaigns do have a European focus, so campaigns like CLOP, for example. Um, we haven't seen any victims in Russia yet. Who knows why? Leave you to guess. Um, but the reason they target the US, we, we believe, is because the attackers figure that that's most, where they're most likely to get a payout. So through a combination of US organizations um, being more likely to have cyber insurance, um, or the whole kind of negotiator kind of ecosystem there encouraging payments, the attackers have clearly made uh, a judgment that the US is where you're most likely to get a, a payout. And so they focus more on, on the US. But you know, it, it's a global problem. We see victims uh, all over the world, except Russia. So in terms of the uh, sectors, um, industrial manufacturing is hit hardest. And these aren't normalized stats, so industrial manufacturing is a, is a large sector, but we still think it's it's significant. So, um, again, the reason why industrial manufacturing is targeted most is because the attackers believe they're more likely to get a payout. So um, they will be able to inflict kind of pain on the on the victim more quickly. So if you're running a factory and your factory gets uh, taken offline, that's going to be an immediate cost that you're suffering. Um, and you know, again, people have insurance in these sectors. You know, they have continuity plans. They're able to kind of get things back and up and running. But once that ransom is paid, um, you know, it, it puts them back on the front foot. Retail is the next sector that's uh, uh, most targeted. And again, you know, it's it's that immediate cost. Also, the fact they've got a lot of personal information, so credit card information, and things like that. 
it then kind of goes down through you know finance insurance uh, legal sector you see a lot of legal sector victims um, maybe less in terms of the initial pain from uh, the ransom but they certainly hold a lot of sensitive information so uh, again uh, probably inclined to pay um, people ask why do sectors like healthcare get targeted I don't know it doesn't really make sense because healthcare is is very unlikely to uh, well certainly frontline healthcare very unlikely to pay um, but you know there are still kind of companies in the healthcare sector um, uh, and so some of that is is also kind of wrapped up in these stats as well think tanks and NGOs yeah probably wouldn't be my first choice if I was if I was thinking of a organization with lots of money that's going to pay but hey they get they get victimized uh, through this as well a little bit in terms of the size of organizations so um, we see all sizes in short we see small organizations you know organizations that are making up to kind of a million in in, in revenue uh, and we see massive organizations organizations that have over a billion uh per year in revenue so i think we got like what 250 organizations that we've seen that are in the, the billion dollar a year um uh, sort of category but the average is uh i guess a a a, a sort of mid-sized organization 10 to 100 million uh in annual revenue so what do all these stats kind of give us in terms of, uh, I guess, the, the overall picture of how much the attackers are making? So we can, we can do a few estimates here, um, not just with what we, we have in this data, but also just looking at some of the public reports of how much people have been ransomed for or how much they've, uh, they've paid even. So from a sample of 20 cases in, in recent months, the average ransom demand is 4.2 million uh, US dollars. Now, if we use that stat from earlier, the 7% of the victims are paid. So that's 7% of the 3,000 victims that we've seen in total. Um, and if we recall that the final payment's not always the initial demand, they will negotiate. Most people will get that demand down. Then you get to a number of 440 million US dollars paid to these criminal groups since the start of 2020. So an absolutely huge sum. If you compare with, you know, uh, groups that were doing making banking trojans and trying to, you know, uh, send payments from people's online banking accounts, you know, maybe they made kind of 10, 20 million a year at most. Uh, these groups, you know, it's 250 million a year that they're making, and there's not a lot of groups. Remember, there's only about 30 different um, blogs that we're tracking, and probably there's some 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 um, uh, uh, common groups across multiple of those blogs. So this is, is a huge amount of money going to a relatively small number of people. There's an interesting um, stat as well from a company called Elliptic um, after the Colonial Pipeline attack. So uh, the group that was behind Colonial was called uh, the Dark Side Group. And Elliptic, through tracking the uh, Bitcoin addresses that were used, they were able to basically identify the the, the, the dark sides wallets, the wallets that they were using. Um, and they looked at the total payments um, just going back to kind of October of last year, and it was 90 million total ransom payments that are already been transferred to the dark side operators' um, wallets. And the average was 1.9 million. So it's actually not too far from what we estimate here, so half of that number, 2.1 million. Um, but again, this is even over a smaller space of time that they'd uh, accumulated 90 million. Um, whether you know they managed to launder all that money, who knows, um, but it's still a massive amount. So, so in total, uh, like I said, this is a 250 million uh, a year industry for these criminal groups. Um, and we don't think that that's gonna stop anytime soon. It's just too lucrative. This uh, tactic of publishing on blogs has really changed the game. It's up the pressure on victims and, you know, it's allowed the attacker another kind of way of, uh, of kind of engaging in this. But also cyber insurance has a role. And, you know, James mentioned it earlier. It's a, it's, a, it's a hot topic of whether to ban cyber insurance payments or not. Um, one thing that's um, less controversial and, and, and should be actioned is either regulating or banning the uh, negotiators as part of this 
um, because they are, you know, a real part of kind of facilitating the the payments, uh, meaning that more money just ultimately gets to the bad guys. So we expect to see more groups coming into it. We expect to see more headlines, but how do we really make uh, any sort of impact on it? So we've broken down the, the key kind of drivers that are are behind um, uh, this at the moment, some of the key enablers. So I mentioned this uh, previously, like cyber insurance, um, but also how can we can we actually tackle some of this? So cryptocurrency is is clearly one of the enablers. You know, um, all of these attacks use Bitcoin, um, uh, and uh, you simply couldn't have done attacks like this at the scale. Uh, uh, before cryptocurrency, I mean, you just you just couldn't have paid these sorts of things with credit cards. I mean, Visa and Mastercard would have just blocked it. Um, but because cryptocurrency is unregulated and and relatively easy, relatively mainstream uh, to get hold of, the attackers are able to 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 use that. So there needs to be more uh, regulations around Bitcoin. So KYC, know your customers and know who you're paying to, uh, and anti-money laundering payments. So it prevents the bad guys actually turning that cryptocurrency back into fiat because they have to kind of prove where they've got it from, etc. Tool proliferation. So a lot of these attacks use uh, COBOL Strike, which is a legitimate pen test tool. Um, we use COBOL Strike. It's 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 a very effective, very uh, versatile tool for doing uh, penetration tests. Um, but we think there needs to be more done to set up abuse mitigation programs so that it can be used legitimately, but it's, you know, there's more to be done to stop the bad guys actually abusing it. Cyber insurance, so uh, policy exclusions uh, around paying ransoms or potentially some more support in recovering funds. So what a lot of the insurers will say is that actually, you know, there's no point trying to ban uh, uh, the payment of the ransoms that will just kind of push it underground but you can use that payment as intelligence. You can use it to kind of track where those funds go. And a lot of the time, you know, the funds will end up in a legitimate organization in, a, in another cryptocurrency exchange in a, in, a, in, a, in a foreign jurisdiction, where if you're quick enough, you know, through legal means, you can get that frozen and that cryptocurrency exchange can freeze those funds uh, and potentially recover them. So yeah, that's another kind of uh, area that needs to be looked at. Clearly, there's, there's still poor cyber defenses and uh, organizations need to do more um, uh, just doing the basics right, so improving two-factor authentication, uh, improving their vulnerability and patch management, improving awareness of phishing emails, managing their uh, their supply chain, putting in place defense in depth. Again, it's all the sort of stuff that we've talked about for years, but it's just getting that done rigorously uh, and um, uh, you know, spotting the early signs of an attack, so spotting the early signs of an alert um, uh, and not, you know, letting that uh, kind of fester in the network. Breaking the business model of the attackers would be effective as well. So, you know, there are criminal enablers, for example, around the cryptocurrency laundering. So if those can be tackled, it will make it harder or more expensive. But also, of course, there needs to be diplomatic pressure. And this has already begun. You've probably have seen uh, the agreement between uh, Biden and Putin to crack down on this, and we're seeing some evidence that that's uh, uh, starting to have an impact uh, and some cooperation coming from uh, the authorities in Russia on that. So that's another angle that needs to be pursued uh, if we're to to move to a better place. So that's all I had for this presentation, and um, thanks all for for listening. If you've got any Q and A, uh, sorry, any questions. Uh, we'll be uh, we'll be happy to um, uh, happy to answer them. So yeah, back to you, Dave. Great, hey, thanks, Adrian. It's yeah, super interesting. We we have a few. Um, I guess we'll start off. Um, Mark sent one off here on the chat. So Adrian, when you're presenting those uh, those stats there, uh, he was asking, are these attacks on Windows? So do you have any thoughts on sort of uh, the operating systems and the split there? Always Windows. Yeah, I mean the attackers are not like unskilled and unable to attack other operating systems. But if Windows is the dominant operating system in enterprise networks, then it makes sense um, in terms of a return on investment to build your tools and capabilities to target Windows. Um, it, it's, you know, it's different if you are, I don't know, a cyber spy and you got to go after different types of networks and then you got to have different capabilities because you never know what your specific target is. But 
criminals will just do what is easiest or what works in the most amount of cases because it's all about just playing the numbers for them. So yeah, for, for ransomware, it's, it's always Windows. Um, James, I'm sure, will pop up and correct me if, if I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm struggling to think of a case where we've seen anything other than Windows. James? Uh, no, it sounds about right to me. Perfect. Uh, wh whilst we've got you there, James, another one. Um, so we've seen a bunch of recommendations here on the slide. Uh, this is a good one. If we had one above all else to, that you can enforce across the entire organization to help prevent ransomware, what would it be and why? Um, well, yeah, I, I think under poor cyber defenses and focus on doing the basics right, Adrian mentioned a, a bunch of great recommendations around hardening um, the network and, and kind of preventing initial access. Um, I've only got one though in, in terms of your question, so I'm actually going to go to the other end of, of kind of the attack and, uh, and actually talk about backups. So being prepared um, for such an event, having a workable backup plan, having offline backups, uh, being confident that you know what to do in the event of an attack. Um, so kind of a combination of yeah, having a, a good backup strategy and a kind of you know incident response playbook around this um, you know, potentially catastrophic event. Um, that's that's really key. And if you if you look at uh, you know, what the NCSC are writing on this and some of their incident management folk that and, and this we see this as well with some of the incidents that that our um, incident response team get called out to. It's there's a huge range of preparedness levels across UK organizations and, and globally as well. Um, you know, I don't know what the percentage of organizations without backups is, but it's it's not zero. Um, and it's probably quite quite worrying actually. So yeah, that'd be my my one. Great. Yeah. Thanks. I, I wouldn't disagree Adrian? with that. Yeah. I mean you can't you can't completely mitigate, you know, the the impacts of course the attacker will steal data and that's that's gonna be a bad day if your your sensitive data gets out in the open. Um, but I've, I've been in situations where we come in to do instant response and, uh, you know, I've, I've seen where uh, people have been briefed that we've lost our production systems and we potentially lost our backups as well. Because in the way that they'd done their backups, the attacker was able to access the backups, delete their backups, and you don't keep backups, your backups. So, um, yeah, it's quite shocking to see people kind of breaking down in tears when they realize, you know, literally decades worth of work is gone. And there's no there's no way to get it back. Um, so it, it can be really really destroying for organisations and individuals um, uh, if that data is totally gone and not recoverable. I mean, that's 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 a lot of effort, you know, over a long time that can have gone into that and potentially potentially sensitive stuff as well. Um, obviously, you know, losing sensitive data, losing kind of people's sensitive health records, things like that. That's dreadful as well. Um, but there's something particularly um, uh, I don't know, psychologically damaging about thinking that, yeah, all of your sort of work that you mm. put in the last 10 years into is just, is just gone. Mm. Yeah, understandably. Um, okay, great, great answers. Thanks guys. Uh, a few more here for you guys. So, uh, how often do you see incidents where payment is made and then demands for further payments are made or encryption keys are not provided and data is leaked anyway? Um, we don't have stats on it. I guess there's been a few cases where victims have popped up again. Not sure they're the same criminals, though. Um, I think it was Stanford University was one instance where they got uh, they got taken for twice, um, and it might it might have been again a different actor who saw that because they paid once, they were kind of an easy target. Maybe don't know. Um, but yeah, with with all of these cases, you know, you're dealing with criminals, so you just can't trust them. I mean, our, our advice is always don't pay. Um, and, you know, I, I think it would have to be some pretty serious circumstances getting into kind of life and death or, you know, massive, massive impact in the organization where we'd consider, yeah, payment's the right thing. But almost always, mm. it's not the right thing. Mm. Okay, interesting. So. Alan uh, Jenkins is asked a good question here. So 
sort of on a similar vein around the payment. So negotiators, Alan's asking the question now, negotiators have long had a role in, in kidnap and ransom cases, so K&R cases. Adrian, why are you signaling them out as enablers rather than the lawyers slash legal counsel who have them on retainer? <laughs> so, Thanks for that, Mr. I, I guess, I, yeah, I mean, they, they deserve to be singled out because they are an enabler and, 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 and there is an ecosystem of enablers, but all of them are, are kind of, they're, they're all economically incentivized to keep this to keep this problem going. You know, the insurers are incentivized because uh, the loss from paying the insurance potentially less than the loss from the impacts of, you know, the network being down offline and having to kind of pay out tens of millions to recover that or uh, or, or payouts from, uh, particularly in the US, you get like class action lawsuits because, you know, a lot of customer data is gone or something like that. So massive class action lawsuit cost a fortune. So yeah, you, you the insurers are incentivized to pay and you know it also partly drives the whole cyber insurance market as well. The the the, the lawyers are incentivized, the negotiators are incentivized, the instant response companies are incentivized, uh, the victims are incentivized. So it's like, how do you kind of break that cycle? I mean, it did happen in 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 the UK. They in the UK in 2014, 2015, they introduced the um, uh, I think it was like counterterrorism bill or something like that, and that outlawed the payment of kidnap and ransom and it also made it explicitly illegal for insurers to pay uh kidnap and ransom because they wanted to break the cycle of people getting kidnapped and british people died after that decision was made because you know they got murdered by the the kidnappers so it was painful in the short term but in the long term it stopped so you know there's, there's plenty that argue that we're in a similar situation with, with 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 cyber ransoms today, and the only thing that's going to break the cycle is making it illegal to pay. Mm. But it's a debate. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, some more coming in, so let, let's keep cracking on. Awesome questions, keep them coming, guys. So next one, Alex is up. He says, with the move towards the connect uh, towards connected factories, do you see the threat expanding beyond the threat of data leaks, possibly infiltrating and paralyzing ERP systems, factory lines, etc., and demanding a ransom to restore? operations. I think you sort of touched on this maybe on the colonial pipeline, but any other thoughts on that connected factories? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I think, yeah, you you have to have that in mind whenever um, increased connectivity and, and different services are being potentially opened up to, well, hopefully not directly to the internet, but, um, you know, a hop or two away from the internet. Um, it's certainly something that I, w I wouldn't be surprised to see in future play out um uh but yeah i, don't, I can't think of a I, th I think at the moment when you see an industrial or an energy company done over with ransomware they generally shut operations down uh for safety reasons um and they and they can't potentially be completely sure um whether the whether the criminal operators have got presence on production systems um but yeah that that could that could potentially change in future yeah, but it's it's kind of a similar problem. If you, if you don't have confidence enough in your systems that you've got to shut them down because you're just worried that some bad thing might happen, then again, you know, you're 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 clearly not in the best of places from a cybersecurity perspective. I mean, if if you if you set stuff up properly and you've put in proper sort of network segmentation and you've tested that and you you've got the best kind of pen testers to look at that, you should still be confident that fine, you've had an impact on the enterprise network, but it's so hard to get across to that operational network. We're going to keep that running and we're not going to be, you know, just worrying about things that could potentially happen. But I appreciate with kind of safety concerns and other stuff. Yeah, that, 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 that's a difficult decision. Uh, indeed. All right. We've got a few more minutes left, so let's rattle through these last few ones. So one from William. What are your thoughts on insiders being paid off to plant backdoors and payloads for threat actors? Who wants to tackle that? <laughs> Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. <laughs> You don't need to. You, the, the the bad guys are simply able to just hack into the networks. If 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 we we're so if, if if security was so good, um, that you know it wasn't that simple for them just to get you know three thousand victims, then yeah, you might see that sort of thing. You know, it 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 happens in in other circumstances like um, uh, criminal groups plant cashiers in banks, for example, they, 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 they get somebody to legitimately apply and get a job as a cashier in a bank. 
and then they work with them as an insider to do the um, you know the stealing of the money that happens but that's because banks have raised their level of kind of security and um, you know doing kind of traditional bank robberies is hard so you've got to go to that next level but the level of cyber security just generally is so bad that they don't need to do that sort of thing there's there's okay. there's, there's always a conspiracy there's always a kind of an insider theory an insider kind of conspiracy with a lot of cases um but it's 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 very rare in practice i think there was an a, attempt wasn't there it was reported in um t one of tesla's factories exactly. in the us yeah. yeah i guess there may be something of a special case when it comes to yeah that, that problem but um yeah i i would say it's if not well definitely rare compared to um all the other stuff maybe yeah. maybe vanishing your rear mm. okay so one one addressing the the crypto um point right here on the slide so jerome's asked uh, ultimately this has been enabled by crypto right isn't the only real solution banning crypto um don't think that's an option i think even if you technically tried to ban crypto you couldn't I mean, it's not it's no it's no one authority that you go to to ban it um you could make it harder to kind of convert from you know real money into crypto so it's more the kind of interface from the the, the mainstream financial system into cryptocurrency uh you could make that harder but um i don't think you could completely get rid of it um just by the the kind of technical nature of it so yeah i mean th there needs to be more regulation around crypto um not just in the kind of the, the getting stuff in so like people paying ransoms in crypto but more how you can get stuff out of crypto into normal currency because you you still can't buy a you know a ferrari in cryptocurrency as far as I, as far as i know um uh so the the bad guys still need to get that back out of cryptocurrency into legitimate funds and um having you know the traditional controls around proof where you got that money um uh I think that sort of thing needs to be enforced. It isn't enforced today because cryptocurrency is kind of a new new thing, a new ecosystem. But if that was enforced, that would that would restrict the attacker's ability um, to use at least legitimate cryptocurrency exchanges or push them into kind of dark cryptocurrency exchanges. And, you know, that's kind of a criminal ecosystem. So they just get the money stolen from them anyway. So that kind of solves that problem. Uh, we, we are up, and I'll just do one last one because this is interesting. It's similar regulation territory. So, should we do be, we doing should we be doing more to pressure law enforcement and prosecuting agencies to be better at catching the criminals and or disrupt the criminal side of ransomware industry? So, what are your thoughts on that side of the fence? But then we'll, we'll wrap up here. I promise. It comes it comes down to the last point on the slide. It it requires diplomatic engagement. I mean, um, you know, it's 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 no secret. All of these groups are Russian speaking criminal groups. Not all cyber criminals are Russian speaking, but all cyber criminals doing ransomware attacks are Russian speaking. And the reason this is, is because they exist on these forums where they collaborate with others in a, in a kind of a, you know, a, a Russian speaking criminal uh, ecosystem. Not all Russian, they're Russian speaking. So, um, you know, without diplomatic engagement, um, we're not gonna see any change in, uh, I guess, the status quo on that. Uh, Russia's got a, a stance of not extraditing its uh, its 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 citizens. So uh, you know, unless it's kind of diplomatic engagement on 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 how to um, you know put more pressure on them domestically, then uh, it's not going to change things. We do see criminals in uh, in Ukraine getting arrested. There's a very interesting case, probably three or four months ago, of uh, um, uh, what's believed to be kind of money launderers associated with a CLOP, one of these ransomware groups, getting uh, arrested in Ukraine. Um, and it's 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 fascinating video footage to watch of the actual bust because the the individuals just live in completely normal looking you know suburban houses. Um, there's like you know drawings from their kids on their fridge. They've got a some pretty nice cars in the drive. I think some large Mercedes and like some Teslas. Uh, but you know it's it's not the latest Lamborghini. Uh, it, it it is a you know, it is a, a, a practical car for moving your kids around. So it's it's interesting to look at those because it kind of does bring home that, you know, these aren't sort of uh, hoodie wearing um, weirdos living in their basement, uh, you know, uh, exploiting victims all around the world. There are people who live relatively normal lives. Their business happens to be cyber crime though. Indeed. Yeah, interesting. All right, well, let, let's close there. I think 
massive thanks for the questions. They're really good stuff. Um, James and Adrian, a huge uh, thumbs up and thanks for joining us today. Uh, those behind the scenes, so Tabby and Nula, who helped to make this event possible. Again, thanks so much. Um, and just a sort of closing remark is that this video will be available on the Soccer West website uh, and uh, on the BA website, and we'll be sharing it on our respective social channels. And yeah, lastly, just thanks, a massive thanks to everyone who joined us today for the questions and wherever you are in the world. I uh, hope you have a cracking rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. That's all right.